Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed a very nice lunch, and I want to recognize and thank Justice Ross, uh, Kate, and Lauren for uh, your gracious hospitality. It's a pleasure to be here in Melbourne, um, all the way across the world from Canada. Um, so what I'd like to do today is um, first give you a little bit of context uh, as to uh, the context in which we operate uh, in the labor and the labor relations framework in Canada before I um, get into two examples of how um, we engaged our stakeholders in um, legislative and regulatory review um, in Canada as it relates to um, labor relations and, and um, labor regulations. Um, so first of all, let's start with, oops, go back. Let's start with the, uh, the map of Canada and how our constitutional, constitutional, constitutional division of powers um, has uh, divided up our uh, responsibility over responsibility and, and accountability over uh, labor matters uh, in Canada. So we have uh, 10 provinces, three territories, and plus the federal level. So in fact, we have 14 jurisdiction um, that regulate uh, labor and employment matters. Um, and so all federal and provincial uh, governments have uh, legislation that govern labor standards or employment standards for individual employment. Uh, situations. Uh, they uh, also regulate health and safety matters as well as uh, they each have their own regime for uh, collective bargaining, uh, the collective bargaining process um, and the uh, unfair labor practices uh, that uh, may, uh, that are prohibited um, during collective bargaining. Um, the uh, provincial jurisdiction uh, have primary responsibility for labor relations and employment matters in Canada. So in essence, they will have jurisdiction in the health, uh, in the health sector, the education sector, uh, manufacturing, mining, uh, construction, insurance, retail, and all the service industries uh, in Canada, which represents the, the large majority of uh, employees uh, and employers in Canada. And in Canada, we have a union density of about 30%, um, uh, and it's uh, fairly, uh, has remained fairly stable for the last five years at 30, 31%. Um, the federal jurisdiction, which is a, a jurisdiction of exception, um, has uh, jurisdiction in those areas where the federal government has primary regulatory responsibility um, as defined by our constitution. And so the, our jurisdiction essentially involves uh, all transportation uh, methods that cross a border, our province, the rail and, and road transportation, uh, airports and airlines, um, navigation, shipping, including longshoring and the ports um, in Canada. Uh, the telecommunications industry, broadcasting industries, the banks, as well as the, uh, the crown corporations like the, our national museums um, and our postal service. So as you can see, our jurisdiction essentially encompasses all the, the, the key infrastructure industries in Canada. Uh, that represents about 8% of the workforce, 8 to 10% of the workforce, so although we're not um, a huge, we don't cover the, the majority of the, uh, the Canadian workforce. Um, we do have a uh, significant impact in our work because uh, when there's a dispute in the rail industry or the air uh, with our national airline, uh, I can tell you there's a lot of focus on uh, our work and our interventions. Um, so despite the fact that we have um, 14 different uh, regimes that uh, regulate or can intervene in labor and employment matters, there's fairly um, consist a fair consistency across uh, all the jurisdictions in terms of the principles of uh, labor and employment um, law and the approach to resolving disputes, and we're very much modeled on the U.S. Wagner Act model in terms of the structure and the, uh, the institutions that, uh, that regulate um, employment and labor. Um, so for example, some of the key principles that um, 
will um, will transpire in all the jurisdictions is that once a union is recognized um, to uh, represent a group of employees in a bargaining unit, uh, it's an exclusive right, uh, and then the individuals have no uh, individual right of recourse. Uh, the union carries that right on their behalf. Um, there's um, broad union security provisions in our legislations across Canada, um, which include uh, mandatory or compulsory deduction of union dues, uh, successor rights in the case of sales of business, there's first contract arbitration that's fairly uh, common across uh, the country as well, uh, a right of reinstatement after a work stoppage, and um, limited uh, what we call open periods where another union can uh, come in and displace uh, an existing union to represent um, the employees or the employees themselves, uh, themselves wishing to um, uh, eliminate their uh, union and their representation rights. There's also a fairly um, broad uh, framework uh, um, and concise framework that regulates the right to strike or the right to lockout, uh, and that includes a process of mediation or a conciliation. And I can tell you that in Canada, the difference between conciliation and mediation is really one of timing. Um, so conciliation is um, uh, during the uh, the first part of um, the, the government's intervention or, or assistance um, for a mandatory period of time uh, in the federal uh, level. At the federal level, that's a period of 60 days where you're in the conciliation process. And then after that, um, the Minister of Labour can continue uh, to offer the service of, of that mediator or that conciliator, but that becomes a mediation period. So, But it really is the same person continuing to do the same intervention with the parties, um, but in different, um, different time frames. Um, so uh, that's our Canadian approach. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, and then there's a, a notice that must be given. There must be strike vote. Uh, there, the parties must address uh, uh, questions around essential services or services that must be maintained during a work stoppage. And, um, and so all those um, conditions have to be met before the parties can resort to um, exercising their, um, their uh, right to strike or lockout. Um, and once a collective agreement is reached, uh, strikes are prohibited and all disputes um, around the interpretation or application of the collective agreement must be um, resolved through a binding uh, arbitration process or grievance procedure. Um, unfair labor practices are defined and prohibited in the legislation. And then um, all the legislation create an independent uh, body, quasi-judicial quasi uh, tribunals such as ours uh, to in, to uh, apply the legislation, deal with unfair labor practice complaint, um, uh, also address union recognition questions, and uh, deal with those matters. So at the present time, um, the um, the my board doesn't deal with individual disputes, but I'll talk. I'll come back to that a bit later because there's a change. A la that landscape is changing for us. Um, so in our jurisdiction, in the federal jurisdiction, um, the jurisdiction that our, our board um, deals with, it's a highly unionized uh, jurisdiction. Um, in the rail, the air transportation, the shipping industry, telecommunications, um, it's, uh, you can see unionization rates of 40 percent, 60 percent in those sectors. Um, but in terms of the history, and uh, I want to give you a little bit of the, uh, um, some of the, the history that we went through in the 80s and 90s, which led to um, an engagement strategy um, by our uh, labor ministry um, that really um, came about from a difficult uh, period of time um, in, um, in our sectors um, because the rail, uh, the postal uh, service, and in our ports, uh, the government found itself to be intervening with back-to-work legislation uh, frequently uh, to end stop, uh, work stoppages um, that were becoming, um, that were crippling the, the economy 
um, and were also um, leading to very difficult situations um, and protracted uh, and long uh, work stoppages that had uh, negative impact, as I said, on our economy, but also on, on those, uh, the workers and the, uh, the employers uh, themselves. Also, at the same time, in the 80s and, and 90s, we were going through uh, technology, significant technology changes, globalization, social demographics, uh, change in the workplaces, um, where uh, different um, realities were facing workers and employers, and they, um, it was becoming um, increasingly difficult to um, to uh, deal with uh, labor unrest in the workplaces because of declining unionization rates and the lack of or the diminished uh, collective voice um, in workplaces and in those industries, which made it difficult to, uh, to address uh, those work stoppages and the resulting negative impact. And so at the time, in the 90s, the, um, the federal government, um, and in particular the, the Minister of Labor at the time, was looking for a different way of addressing those challenges and seeing if we couldn't deal with or, or develop a framework that would allow employers and employees to um, uh, better address those disputes. And so the, the leadership of the uh, Department of Labor at the time engaged in um, uh, a process whereby they went out to the employers um, to the, the community, essentially, the labor relations community in the federal jurisdiction um, with a broad consultation strategy. Um, they appointed three experts, uh, three labor relations experts, um, and started consultations across the country um, with public sessions in various cities, also invited uh, written submissions from, um, from stakeholders. And that process took um, approximately um, eight months um, to complete. At, at the end of that process, um, a final report was um, was submitted to the to the Minister of Labor at the time, um, and it really um, uh, took into consideration the input from the key stakeholders in our jurisdiction, and I've listed them there, but. They're fairly um, uh, sophisticated uh, organizations, uh, institutions um, that uh, represent and um, speak on behalf of their uh, constituents. Um, so FETCO, the federally, um, federally regulated employers in transportation and communication represent about 80% of the employers in our jurisdiction. Um, and then we have the Conseil de Patronat du Québec, which is a, a Quebec equivalent um, of our French-speaking uh, province, um, as well as our small business association. And on the labor side, we have the Canadian Labor Congress uh, that represents uh, the majority of, of trade unions in Canada. Um, and then, of course, the Canadian Bar Association and um, government uh, representatives and officials. So those um, organizations were all involved in the consultations. And um, uh, after the consultations were completed, uh, that information was, was taken to these uh, specific organizations. And uh, a, consens a consensus building uh, approach was undertaken to try to bring labor and management on um, a common uh, common page in terms of uh, what the legislation should look like, what the framework should look like to resolve disputes. So as I said, a final report was um, um, uh, presented to the Minister of Labor um, in 1998 and um, they proposed uh, new, a new statutory framework for collective bargaining in the federal jurisdiction. And um, the parties um, agreed on the framework, except for one, one issue, uh, and that was the issue of replacement workers uh, and whether um, they were gonna be permissible or not. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, the parties came together, uh, took into consideration all the information um, collected through uh, the consultation process and arrived at a, um, 
consensus on how we should be dealing with uh, disputes in the federal uh, sector. So following that report, the government um, tabled legislation, uh, presented legislation in Parliament that essentially adopted the report and um, overhauled the labor, uh, the labor legislation uh, and the collective bargaining framework um, for uh, the federal sector. Um, and uh, it dealt with uh, things like the timeline um, during which you will engage uh, in collective bargaining to renew your collective agreement. It dealt with the, uh, the conciliation and, and uh, the mediation uh, process and the timelines that would be uh, allocated to that and the resources that would be uh, provided for that and uh, the federal mediation and conciliation in, in service in Canada is part of the Department uh, of Labor and uh, so their role is clearly defined in the legislation as to their interventions during this period. It provides as well for a 21 day cooling off period after the, the mandatory conciliation process, and this is the period which, in which uh, the, the conciliator mediator continues to work with the parties um, despite the mandatory conciliation process uh, having ended. Uh, it also addresses the issue of essential services, as I discussed earlier. There is a process for the parties to address that question, and if they are unable to resolve it, uh, it's brought to the board for a determination and the parties cannot uh, resort to the right to strike or lockout until that decision is made or that issue is resolved. And it also re uh, created at the time or, or um, redefined our board as a representative board, um, meaning that uh, our board members, uh, in addition to the chair and the neutral vice chairs, we have representative members, so three members from the union side, three members from the employer side, um, and, uh, and, uh, and they, um, uh, they deal with the disputes that emanate from the collective bargaining process and uh, representation rights. So essentially the legislation um, that was uh, developed and presented and ultimately adopted um, and implemented became um, the social contract of the parties, if I can use that term, um, by which the parties agree, um, uh, the parties abide by the rules of the game. And so there's no dispute now about the process, there's no dispute about um, whether someone is being um, uh, favored uh, by uh, the government in, the, in their intervention. The parties agreed to the rules of the game and, um, and it really, um, made a difference in um, the stability in our jurisdiction. And as a result of that, so the legislation was adopted in, in uh, 99 and implemented in 2000, and as a result of that, we've seen um, no intervention by um, the government for the, the, the following uh, eight years. Um, and so uh, that was a uh, demonstration, I believe, that uh, the process worked um, and the parties um, uh, agreed that the rules of the game were fair um, and it provided for a period of stability in the, uh, in the process. So the creation, I just want to spend a moment on the creation of our board and uh, the role that we play. Um, in adjudication, but also in um, policy, uh, policy decision and, and rulemaking on how we will adjudicate and process matters. Um, we also, um, as a board, have uh, a group of professional um, uh, labor relations officers who um, will intervene uh, once we have complaints, complaints that are filed with us will intervene and uh, try to assist the parties in resolving that complaint uh, before it goes to uh, adjudication. And uh, they resolve 50% uh, of those complaints um, that, and that don't require adjudication at the end of the day because of their uh, interventions. So that's one example where the, uh, the broad engagement of the community um, resulted in a very positive um, uh, uh, results. The, the second example that I'll touch on very briefly is at our board, 
um, we've instituted a client consultation committee. And that committee um, is really essentially an advisory uh, body for the chair of the board um, in how we uh, develop policy and how we implement our processes. Um, again, we're dealing with the same parties, uh, institutional parties that I talked about earlier, FEPCO, the Canadian Labour Congress, and um, some others. Um, and really, they uh, bring to the chair of the board their uh, input, their advice, their feedback on how we're doing, um, how uh, our processes are working for them and their constituents. And I hear from them on any improvements that they would like uh, to see. It's also a confidential um, forum for them to share that information without fear of um, uh, having a negative impact on their individual cases before the board. And that's one reason why we, we keep it confidential so that they feel uh, comfortable uh, sharing uh, any negative feedback that they'd like to share with the board without having, um, uh, without fearing uh, negative consequences for their individual ca cases that they may be arguing before the board. Um, so they've been very helpful in terms of uh, helping me uh, the chair, as chair of the board um, uh, put in place um, improvement uh, programs or initiatives to help address uh, and rectify some of the issues that they're facing um, when they deal with the board. So uh, last slide is um, just the challenges of the future uh, for us. As I mentioned initially, um, we are not currently responsible for individual employment disputes, but there is legislation that was just recently adopted this summer which will um, transfer responsibilities to us for, for those areas of uh, individual employment as well as occupational health and safety uh, uh, complaints and appeals. And so that's a whole different ball game, uh, as people know, in Australia with Fair Works, uh, the Fair Works Commission dealing with individual complaints um, and the, the, the number of uh, self-represented complainants coming to the commission and the challenges that that brings uh, for the adjudicators and the agency. Um, it'll be different for us as well because we're dealing, as we heard this morning from an, another speaker, one-time users of your services. And so we'll have to shift our approach um, because we won't be dealing as much with the institutional uh, organizations that we were dealing with traditionally. So we'll certainly have to shift our approach and, and find ways to reach out to the, the one-time users. So I very much look forward to hearing from uh, other organizations and how they deal with the, the citizens that are using the services um, for, for the first time and maybe the last time. So <laughs> thank you for your attention.